My name is Lalu Davies Yemitin, and you're listening to My Brother Podcast. I hope that when my life ends, I would have added a little beauty, perception, and quality quality for those who follow. Jacob Lawrence was one of the foremost African American artists of the 20th century. I will preach with my brush, said Henry Osawa Tanner. My guest today has been doing just that, preaching with his brush for a very long time. He's an academician, he's an artist, and just an uh, overall incredible, incredible person. Uh, Floyd Newsom, thank you so much for making yourself available uh, to join us on the podcast today. Uh, I want to get right into it. Why don't you tell us a bit about yourself, a little bit about your background and sort of who you are and what you do today? Well, thanks for inviting me. Uh, very delighted to be a part of this. You know, those two artists that you were talking about before I say anything about myself, uh, Jacob Lawrence is one of the first African-American artists to show in a gallery in New York City. And uh, because of his isolation, he almost had a nervous breakdown because he was the only one. Hmm. Tanner is expatriate because of the things that happened to him in Philadelphia. He had to go to, he had to go to Paris and work. So those two artists are are critical in the history of, of African American art in the United States. Well, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, born uh, and reared there, uh, 1950, and uh, uh, great dad and great mom, a brother and a sister plenty of cousins, aunts, and uncles. And during my uh, my lifetime there as a young youngster, didn't know much about what really was going on until the 60s appeared and we had that sanitation strike. That's when my eyes really started to, to open. Mm. And uh, during that period of time, my work reflected the social, uh, the social makeup and social uh, conditioning of what was going on in, in, in the African American community, and then it, it evolved as as we'll see uh, and talk about uh, as we go through this. Memphis was a was a, a great place to, to to be reared because during that time, families family structure was important. And uh, back, my father was a part of uh, the uh, PTO or PTA at that time. So you talk about the um, the sanitation strike. I, I can't even imagine, you know, the, 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 I've been to the mountaintop speech by Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, was one of his most incredible speeches. Uh, I've even, you know, recently been so mesmerized by it that in a particular version, at least the version that I've heard, he gives the story about the parable of uh, the Good Samaritan. And he talked right. about that winding road on the way. And he talked about how he felt like he understood when he and his wife visited there, why uh, Jesus chose that setting for uh, for that parable. What was striking to me was um, he described, uh, he uses that parable to draw a parallel to what those sanitation workers were enduring. And that was in 1968. And in that speech, he said, you know, he gave the example of the Levite, the priest, and then came the Samaritan. And he said, that, you know, he said probably the Levite and the priest said, if I stop to help the sanitation worker, what will happen to me? But King said the, Samarit the Good Samaritan must have reversed the question. If I do not stop to help the Good Samaritan, what would happen to him? And right. he said, that's the question before us tonight. If I do not stop and help the sanitation worker, what would happen, not what will happen to my job and my life, but what would happen to them? Right. Uh, so the fact that you grew up in Memphis during that time, I, I just think it's incredible. And so I, uh, my, I'd say I want us to go back to uh, have you talk about what were your early years like uh, being reared in, in Memphis, Tennessee? Well, uh, <clears throat> dad was a firefighter. In fact, my dad and my uncle were, 
were first in their two in their two different careers. My dad was one of 12 black firefighters back in 1955. They were integrating in the South, the mm -hmm. departments. They already had black policemen. Of course, they couldn't they couldn't arrest whites. Um, and they had to pr probably patrol more more of the black communities than anything. But my dad was one of 12. And my uncle was one of the first U.S. Marshals. And they both have unique stories. My, my dad, actually, when we were talking about King, when the day before King was killed, my dad was transferred from the station that was in front of Lorraine Motel. Okay, so my dad was, was at the, at the uh, fire station that was maybe 50 yards away from the from the Lorraine Motel where King was, okay? Mm -hmm. And they shipped my dad out the night before. They shipped the other black firefighter out two days before. And the black lieutenant, I'm not black lieutenant, black detective, they shipped him out hours before King was killed. And they told him for his safety, he needed to leave. He said, well, I feel safe here. He said, no, for your safety, you need to leave. So we've always considered that a conspiracy. But growing up in Memphis, uh, it was, it was um, I went to segregated schools. So I had never experienced any whites until I, I went to Memphis Academy of Arts, which is called Memphis College of Art, uh, as of probably April this year, because it, 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 it was, uh, it closed, it closed this year. It was a private school and they lack funding. But uh, growing up in Memphis was, uh, was uh, it was the Memphis barbecue and the blues and 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 this just the high school uh, uh, rivalries you know football and basketball and and just I just had a great time until I got to be around seventeen years old and that's when I started <clears throat> really understanding what was going on. Uh, King came to town. The sanitation strike had started. And my father would and I would go to these meetings at the Claiborne Temple, and 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 um, I remember uh, the uh, the last the last uh, <clears throat> march he had in Memphis. That was a riot. Well, well, there was some troublemakers, and we figured they were just plants. But anyway, um, my dad got maced all up, and my brother and I were put in jail. So my dad didn't go to jail, but it was a good thing he didn't because he was the one that got us out of jail. But I didn't know that story until about an hour and a half ago when my brother reminded me why my dad wasn't in jail. And so my experience with, with Memphis uh, was good and bad, you know, because that's, that's some, some horrible uh, uh, stories I could share, you know, just the, just the whole history of Memphis. You know, it's where uh, Bedford, uh, what's his name? Bedford Forrest, 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 what was his first name? I've got his, he's one of the, he's one of the first Klanmen. Bedford Forrest, I believe, yeah. And uh, he owned slaves in Memphis and he was a hell of a uh, uh, cavalryman. He was kind of like a Sherman. <laughs> mm. And uh, I remember he captured some Union troops and some were black. They, they imprisoned the whites, but they killed the blacks. Mm. So I started learning a lot of history as I got older. But, be, but before then, it was, it was me and my dad skating up and down the hills where, where we lived. And my dad taking uh, friends to my Uncle Dudley's farm in Mississippi, riding mules. And so I had a, I had a really nice uh, rearing with my mom and my dad, dad, firefighter, my mom's secretary. So you mentioned that you attended the Memphis Academy of Arts. Uh, what led to that? Well, that's, that's, that's a unique thing too, because I was accepted to um, Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri, African-American school. And I was really excited about that. And something, I started reflecting on on my high school experience, how 
my teachers, uh, they were good teachers. The art teacher, uh, he was very good, but he he limited the things that we could do. He had us copying other paintings as opposed to drawing from life, drawing our own hand, or drawing one of the, one of our friends a portrait. And so I started thinking. I said, you know, if I go to this school, I'm going to end up being just a high school teacher. So I applied for Memphis Academy of Arts at that time. And my dad said, and I got accepted. My dad was really upset. He said, you're going to go to a school that's just art? I said, yeah, dad, I'm going to be an artist. And he got really nervous and upset. But I, I guess my mama must have convinced him that, you know, let me do it. And um, so they paid for my tuition and I went on to Memphis Academy of Arts. <laughs> so this was after high school. But so take me back then. Where did your interest in art begin? Oh, my in 1995, my mama passed away in 2002. But in 95, we went home to Memphis for Christmas. And we had a big group family portrait. And my wife told me several years ago, she said, you know, your mom told me, when you were four years old, she knew you were going to be an artist. And I said to myself, what? She said, yeah, she, she told me that she knew you were going to be an artist when you were four years old. So I imagine I probably was drawing on everything, even the walls. But I didn't recognize I was going to be an artist. I was in the third grade. Third grade. And uh, I just had a passion for drawing. I would draw cowboys and Indians. I would color in the coloring books. <clears throat> My cousin was my mentor. He, he loved to draw, and he stopped. But I kept, I kept drawing. I kept having that 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 uh, impulse to be creative. And in um, fact, there were two things that 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 um, I could always uh, remember about growing up. I had that passion to be an artist, but I also had a passion to be a servant. And I recall, because I could walk from my home to school. And so we, so we wasn't, no, we didn't need a bus or anything. Uh, so one of my friends and I, we were coming home from, from, from junior high and this guy was getting beat up. And my friend and I, we just stopped the fight and separated the guy. We didn't side, we just separated. And I felt that was the first part of my life that said I was gonna be a servant. I need to help people, you know, uh, and so, I call myself an artist social servant. <laughs> and they, they both work together. I mean, even today I do things in, in, in the community. Uh, and so the art and being a social servant are inseparable. And so growing up, uh, my aunt, she bought my first painting. I think it was, I think she bought it for $18. And she made me give her a receipt, my aunt Emily. <laughs> My Aunt Emily, and um, uh, she was a big encourager. I did a painting called Thirsty. <laughs> it was acrylics on on a, a, a canvas board. She has it today. In fact, when the Smithsonian opened up a few years ago, I mean, you know, I'm in that collection. She and my other aunt, Aunt Joe, went to DC so that so they could could help me celebrate being in the Smithsonian. So my mother, my father, my mother and father allowing me to go to Memphis Academy of Arts, my aunt encouraging me, buying my first painting, my dad supporting me, you know, not, you know, allowed me to have my dream. My mom allowed me to have my dream. So you're, you, you're this early on, and I think it's always unique when I talk to folks who early on in their lives, especially being a third grader, you were so clear about what you wanted to be that you were unmistakably going to follow that path. Do you have any idea why it had become so resonant and you were so convicted of what your, uh, your purpose in life was going to be or your calling in life was to be? I think some people are unique in knowing that God has given them a mission. And my mission was to was to make art. And, 
And I, I'm a kind of guy that I felt I felt so much in love with it that I had a plan. And my plan, first of all, was to go to that art school so that I could teach in a college. So if I taught in a college, I could still work on my own work. Where if I taught in a high school, that's eight hours, five days a week. Now we we know college life is not just teaching those class, you got committees and all kinds of stuff. And so you end up doing a lot more than you think. But uh, uh, it was what they call it, impulse. Some yeah. have the impulse to become creative. And by nature, it's in, the, in them that they're drawn to make something of beauty. Mm-hmm. And then there are others who admire it. And then there's those who would buy it. But the impulse in my life was to create it. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> because I never wanted to do anything else or be anything else, I became obsessed with it. Still today. So you you finished high school, and I'm sure by then you're drawing and creating all kinds of things. Uh, but I want you to walk us through what was your experience like going through the Memphis Academy of Arts and how important was it that you got in there as opposed to like Lincoln, which you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. You might have preferred. Yeah, that was um, there were 12 of us. I think my dad was 12 firefighters. There were 12 African-Americans at this school and uh, being in a segregated environment and also, you know, during that time, and still maybe even today, well, maybe not so much today, but during that time, because of segregation, I almost felt that I may have been inferior in my skill with my white uh, classmates. And I remember being in a figure drawing class and we were drawing and the model has to take a break. So I said, I'm gonna walk around and see what the other students are doing. And when I walked around and saw what they were doing, and saw what I was doing, I said, hey, these guys aren't any better than me. In fact, I'm better than a lot of them. And that built my confidence. I said, cause you know, Memphis in the fifties and sixties, uh, books were second, secondhand, et cetera, you know? And so that's when I, my, I really got my confidence up because this, that whole, that whole stereotype, that whole way of uh, education was destroyed. The inferiority part. Mm -hmm. I'm there with them. I saw that I was equal to to everyone. And so um, (laughs) it was during the 60s, right? And we we had a small group of Black Panthers there and I was affiliated with them. And I, so, while at, at that school, I would sell Black Panther papers. And my professors, were they were left-wing kind of guys, they would buy them, students would buy them. And, and so it was it, it was a good environment for me because uh, it, the, everybody was accepted. Mm. It was accepted. Had it been uh, a lot of tension, then I would have had a different kind of experience. But at, at that school, I guess because we were all artists, now, there were some guys who I'm sure were racist, um, but I guess after we started playing a little football together, we didn't have a team, but we'd go out there and play satellite football. And when they saw how to be, we could hit them as hard as they could hit us and we could pass and do every, all the things they were doing and we could draw and do everything else, sculpt, then barriers were kind of broken and, and people started being just regular people. So that experience was, was fulfilling for me because it also gave me the opportunity I started re- learning and reading about my own art history, black art history. I invited the late uh, David Driscoll, who at that point was, cha- was chair of the art department at Fisk University. He was the first African-American to come to Memphis Academy of Arts. And we were friends <clears throat> all, of my, all of my life with him, all my adult life. He passed away this, you know, a little bit before well, actually, doing I think during the early part of the, of, the, of this virus coming to, to America, 
Yeah. And David and I, uh, we were dear friends. Mm. Then as I matriculated through that school, I invited a guy by the name of Paul King, who actually became my mentor. And he was the second African-American. And so by being at, at Memphis Academy of Arts, he asked me, he said, what are you going to do after this? I said, I'm going to go to a graduate school, but I just don't know where. He said, apply to Temple University Tyler School of Art. And I'm going to be a reference. And that's what I did. Mm. That, that got me into Temple, Tyler School of Art. We became so, close friends, too. Yeah. When I moved there, I moved out in the suburbs close to where he was. <laughs> yeah. I like it. So you've had these two influences with David and Paul uh, while you're at the academy. By this point in your trajectory, had you sort of honed in on what your style was as an artist? Well, okay, in undergraduate school, it was always sort of a social issue that, that I, I made. Um, I, was a, I was a realist. I painted realism, I, I drew realism. And um, when I got to graduate school, well actually, before, well, actually my senior year at Memphis Academy of Arts, I did this sort of surrealistic work of this woman coming out of this flower. And there were bubbles, you know, all around her. There was this, she was in this huge lily pod. And there were eyeballs inside these bubbles. And they were floating all around. And, and there were these strange plants. And uh, it, was, it, was, it, was gonna, it was a beautiful painting. And uh, we, went for, we went for Christmas break. And I came back and someone had gotten into our studios and they had, they had squeezed paint over, uh, over a lot of paintings. But with my painting, they cut the eyes out of the woman. Man, I was so distraught. But then I sat down for a moment. I said, you know what? I made this canvas like they did in the olden days. And in the olden days, they would, they would, they would take the canvas, stretch it. They would put... Uh, 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 Rabbit skin glue on it, which is clear. Then they will coat a white lead over it. You don't, you can't, you can't use lead anymore, okay? Because a lot of kids, you know, they're eating the paint and they were dying from it, and they were becoming, you know, ill. So I did. I, I made this canvas in the traditional way, and they cut the eyes out really even, you know, really even. So I got this book called Ralph Mayer's The Handbook for Artists, and it showed. It showed or taught me how to repair my canvas. So I repaired the canvas, finished the painting, and was accepted to Tyler. So the painting was like six foot by eight. And so it was it was in my dad's den, laying up against the wall. And I recall, I'm not sure if it was that Christmas or a year later, my dad said, son, um, I have to take that painting down, but don't worry. I folded it up real neat. <laughs> I said, oh my God, he folded it up. You have to roll a painting up. But my dad folded it up. And I said, oh, well, that page is gone. You know, yeah. so the guy who cut the eyes out thought he had destroyed it. But my dad, not realizing, folding it up neat was not the way to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. That was something. Yeah, yeah, so... Uh, you know, I think you were talking about, you know, the transition from. Yeah. So for realism, to going to graduate school, uh, I met Richard Colner and, and um, Roger Anlacker. And they, they were sort of surrealists, too. And that's why they kind of influenced me, along with uh, <clears throat> Jacob Lawrence and Romare Bearden and Paul King. But because they were my teachers, they taught me some techniques. And I remember I, I was kidded. They would kid me and say, you know, why are you working as an apprentice under Richard Colner? You know, uh, back, all he has is apprentice are, are women. I said, well, I don't care. I said, hey, I'm a real man. And I want, I said, the opposite word is I'm in school. The matter of his graduate school, I'm still trying to learn some things. So I would go over there and pay on his canvases. He taught me some things that he did not teach in class. 
And so that influenced me on, on color and on, on application of paint on the canvas. And then going, and he was a, he painted in oil. And I was painting oil and acrylics at that time. And then I would go over to Roger Ann Lacker's studio and watch him paint in gouache. G-O-U-A-C-H-E is sort of an opaque watercolor. You need to think about gouache is that you can you can put a black surface down and put yellow over it and still be yellow. Mm. Okay. Um, well, Roger wouldn't let me paint on his paintings. <laughs> mm. Let me watch him paint. And so that influenced me on 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 sort of changing my direction on, on how I saw the world. And did I really need to always project realism? Can I integrate abstraction and realism? And so that was my evolution of moving from paintings that were just strictly academically realistic to where I started to you know, distort the figure, I would use uh, collage elements and, and produce uh, whimsical colors and settings. Then I started coming up with some of my own little marks. I would look at African art, oceanic art, a variety of cultures, and I would extract from those cultures a variety of, uh, of, of marks and then make them into my own marks. And so my evolution uh, and, I, and I believe students should always learn how to draw realistically, paint realistically, before they go into abstraction, because you need to know the basics. And so I had to learn all those basics. And as, as Gordy would say, yet at 80, yet I still learn. And even today, I, I'll be 70 in November, I'm still learning things. And that's, that's the key, too, that you don't stop learning, that you don't stop uh, realizing that you can go even further with, with your craft. And so my maturity uh, developed uh, in graduate school. And then I was told by one of my professors, he said, you, it's going to be 10 years after grad school that, that, you, that you're going to really realize what you're doing. And for me, that was just about right. Uh, uh, I, was, I came here in 76 in Houston. And it was around 80, 86 that I really started to grow. And in 86 is when I went to New York for, uh, in the show. So uh, that's an interesting story too. Mm -hmm. Before you told me that story of 86, help me understand the transition from grad school and what led you to Houston. Okay, it was a job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, actually, let me just tell you about a, a fear I had. See, I, I, sh I could have been in New York. My my late aunt, my daddy's uh, older sister, had passed away, and she owned a brownstone in in Brooklyn, in Park in uh, Park Slope. That's a very rich neighborhood, and she bought this four story building by herself in the fifties. And before she died, she willed that building to my father, and. Uh, so I was in Philadelphia and I, ha I didn't have a job uh, upon graduating. I was still looking for one. And I, I should have called my dad and said, Dad, I think I'll move to New York and I'll, I'll manage the building. But I was scared. I said, I got, a, I got a wife. I got a child on the way. I got to have a job, a real job. You know, uh, you know I got to make sure I get paid. And so... I was hired at, uh, I actually was hired at Prairie View University mm. as art professor. And I asked the professor, could I teach, or ask the president, could I teach figure drawing? And he said, no, can't teach figure drawing. He said, son, if the, kid, the boys run around here with swimming trunks on, they might, people might get upset. <laughs> so, so I went home back to Philadelphia and told my wife, I got a job, but I really don't want to go. I told my dad, I said, boy, you better go to Philip. You better go to, to Houston and get that, take that job. But I didn't take it. I uh, I worked uh, full time at Sears. I worked part time at Bucks County Community College where Paul King got me that job because he was going on sabbatical. And I worked part time at, at, at the post office. I had three jobs. I got very little sleep. Now, the post office job was temporary. It was like three months, okay? And, and, and the teaching job at Bucks County was for a whole semester. 
But Sears, that was 40 hours every week. And the post office job started at uh, from 11 to 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. in the morning. Mm. So I had to be down to uh, to Sears around 9 o'clock, okay? So anyway, so um, this, my experience of going to, to Prairie View out in the country, I, I said, oh, I just can't take that job. So I didn't. And then I, uh, I sent my application to University of Houston, and they sent my application to downtown. And so I got that job at 76, and I've been here ever since. Wow. But that's how I got, that's how I got to Houston. That's how, uh, from graduate school, uh, I started teaching and helped develop the art department at the, at the downtown campus. Mm. I mean, so this is, um, you know, your story is emblematic of so many artists. It's almost, I'm sitting here and I'm like, well, I guess he was a quasi st starving artist there for a while. I mean, having a full <laughs> <laughs> multiple jobs together just to get by. And I'm glad mm -hmm. that you shared that because, you know, that's an important part of the story because oftentimes right. people know you now as, oh, he's a college professor, but you did what you had to do. Uh, exactly. With, with a wife and kid uh, on the way. Uh, and then you sharing with me that this was in 76. I mean, this was just a few years after that university was founded. So why right. don't you walk us through, you You pack up from Philadelphia where you'd been at Temple for grad school. You moved to this new place. I mean, fortunately, yeah. you were in the South. So you had some familiarity with sort of the Southern traditions. But what was life like coming to this new, you know, relatively new school at that time at University of Houston downtown in 76? Yeah, let me tell you, uh, before I went to my interview, uh, I had a big afro. And I said, OK, I better cut my fro down a little bit. So I did for the interview. And and um, I got the job. I was the second African-American to be hired at UH downtown. Ozzie Gibbons from New York City was in criminal justice. He was the first. And he was tenured and then I, I got tenured. And that's a story about getting tenured there too, which we might want to talk about later on. <laughs> but uh, I remember I remember on the application, it said, are you a part of the Communist Party? And I said, no. But in my mind, I said, oh, but man, I was work, I was doing dealing with the Black Panthers. I said, I hope they don't look that up because I may not get the job. And so uh, I remember every summer I would work in New Jersey uh, on a soda truck in Clifton, New Jersey. My uncle was a truck driver. And like I would do, I, I would do anything to make it. But my daddy gave me work ethics. And so every summer I would go to New Jersey to work with my uncle. And my daddy called me one day. He said, son, the FBI want to talk to you. I said, why? He said, well, the activities you, you, you were carrying on here. So they're going to come to Uncle, Uncle Rob's house and talk to you. So I remember one day we came home and there was this long Ford LTD with a black and a white FBI agent in it. And they, they introduced themselves and wanted to know, could they, could they talk to me in the car? My dad and said, no, you come to my house. And you can talk to my nephew. And so we had a long conversation there. We had a long conversation. But um, uh, going, going to University of Houston downtown was a unique experience because uh, during that time, I was there was only me and one other art professor. And he was of age. And I was coming in with these new ideas, you know, and new things I wanted to teach. Um, coming here, you know, the school at that, at that, at that time was, was a lot smaller and the population was totally different today, you know, it's primarily Hispanic and, and, um, it, it's, it's good that we can, that we can have a, a, a student body, um, that has, I think 57, 55, 57% Hispanic, about 20 seven maybe 28 percent african-american and 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 uh i've had a great great time working there and, and and being involved with the students and so it's uh that was my my uh my experience with prairie view 
wouldn't allow me to teach this one subject. I decided not to go there. And when I asked that same question to, to UH downtown, they said, yeah, you can teach whatever you need to teach, you know? And so uh, that's why I'm still, at U, that's why I got the U of H downtown. That's why I'm still there. Although I only have <laughs> maybe a year or two left <laughs> ah. and be a full-time artist. I got it. Got it. Got it. And um, so, and I'm a UHD grad, obviously, of which I'm very proud, but to yeah. have had such a long tenure at the same university, I think that's just fantastic because I'm sure other opportunities uh, have come along the way. But before that might have happened, you start out in 76. Uh, you mentioned earlier that it wasn't until sort of 10 years post uh, grad school that you sort of really came into your own. Would you talk about what those first 10 years were like and how you finally, you know, and at which point you felt like you finally come into your own as an artist? Yeah, well, I think my my uh, <clears throat> evolution was I was an activist, you know, going to jail a couple of times. And, and I decided, you know, I really want to paint. I really want to paint things that I just, that I sincerely want to paint without it making a social statement. I said, I, I make, I make, I, I deal with the social issues, you know, uh, in my daily activities. And I said, you know, I want to have the freedom to paint and use color the way I, I feel at this point, I, I, I want to really just <clears throat> transition. And I used to have a guilty, a guilty part of me that said, you know, man, you know, you got, to, you got to show something Afrocentric or whatever. And I said, you know, uh, artists are supposed to do what they want to do. And there are enough realistic artists, you know, in our community and there, and then there's those that are doing abstraction. So, my evolution came because I finally got over not feeling guilty. And when you see my works, you'll still see some things that are symbolic. But primarily when you look at my work, it's all about color. Uh, form is secondary to the color for me. Uh, the marks, or my march now, and it gives my work a distinct flavor. And uh, so I just decided that uh, I needed to, to really deal with my inner, inner feelings uh, and then project those feelings on paper, on canvas in a way that, that makes me unique. Every artist should have some, something about themselves that is unique. And I didn't think realism was doing enough for me. So parallel to this evolution you're um, experiencing as an artist, uh, you're also having to be a full-time college professor uh, and all of the elements that come with it. I'm sure tenure was on your mind. So during that same period, can you sort of talk about in a parallel world what was going on with your uh, profession as a as an educator yeah <clears throat> well you know getting tenure you got to do your research you got to do, do great teaching and you got to do service those are the three components the, the number one is teaching scholarship and then service and i'm not sure if you're aware of my history but when i when i uh when i uh went up for tenure I didn't actually make it. There was a 5-4 vote, five against, four for me. I was surprised. That broke my heart. <laughs> mm. I was very upset. And I decided to grieve. And uh, it was a, it was a, that was a part of my life where I really, it was a, it was a, a dark, part of my life because I had just bought this home I'm in and and um, it was very high interest rate 
And my son was what about he was he was uh, about six seven years old. And so the the grievance the grievance uh, ended up with two professors coming to uh, evaluate me. One from Rice and one from Rhode Island School of Design. And I, I didn't know those guys. They didn't know me. And they were at U of H downtown for, I believe it was a week, maybe two weeks. I can't remember exactly what, what the time. I know it wasn't less than a week, okay? And they would go, they would talk to students. They looked over my syllabus, they talked to me. And so I think it was just, just they, were, they, were, they were there just four weeks. That Friday, or that Thursday night, that Thursday night, uh, I, had a, I had a dream. And the dream said I had six years of trouble, the seven year, uh, no, not, nothing would harm me. Actually, I forgot, no, it wasn't a dream. I, I woke up. That's what it is. I'm sorry. I woke up and I got the Bible. <laughs> That's what it was. And I didn't know where I was going to go. I just opened the book and I went to Job. And I forgot what chapter it is, but it talks about six years of trouble and seven years, no, nothing would, would touch you. And that was like a light bulb. I said, okay, I won this grievance. The next day, uh, I was told that, uh, that, 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 that the guys, they said to me, they didn't see any problem, but they had to write a report and for me not to be, you know, all nervous all over the weekend. And so when the, when the decision was made to give me tenure, they didn't give me rank. When you get tenure, you're supposed to get the next rank, associate professor. But I got tenure as assistant professor. Now, and that, now that really made me bad, too, because I said, okay, <laughs> you got these two guys from two Ivy League schools. They say I'm okay. My school's not an Ivy League school. Why are they going to disregard what they say, what they say? But that was, this, that was sort of the way of... Uh, making amends that they, I keep my job, but it won't give me the rank. So my daddy taught me long ago. Uh, my brother and I were talking about this. Our daddy was a tough guy and he would test us to see what, how we were convicted. And so what I, I learned growing up is that if you tell me no, or if you give me a problem, you're only making me stronger. You don't make me weak. I get mad. Then I start to think, how can I, how can I work through this problem? How can I solve this, this problem? How can I deal with, with living through this? So what I told myself, I said, you know what? I'm going to be the first full professor in the department. And by golly, I was. <laughs> and so, so that was really... That's that. That's that was my payback. Mm. I said I'm not gonna focus on on the on the decision of denying me. I'm not gonna focus on being assistant professor, not an associate. I'm gonna focus on being bigger than most of them, or almost all. Not just my department, but the whole university. Mm. So that's what I'm gonna focus on, and that's what motivated me. I said, okay, I'm gonna show you with God's help. Without the Lord, I can't do anything. Like there in, in, the, in, the, in the book, in Psalms uh, 90, I think it's 17, it talks about glorifying God, and, he, and you ask God to bless the work of your hands. And that's mm -hmm. what I do. I use my hands to produce work. And so uh, I decided that my faith would get me through it, and that my also my determination never to be uh, uh, defeated. And so uh, that tenure quest was, <laughs> that, that was something, that was something. Yeah, yeah. And I'm glad that you shared that. I think um, so much of, uh, of success is in fact uh, 
failure or challenges or obstacles along the way. Um, as you're dealing with this, you talked about being undergirded in a sense by uh, your faith and belief, uh, but you, de you dealt with something at that point in your career that's very material and very real that I would um, that a number of people who are probably going through their careers in education today have to deal with the same thing. So what advice would you offer about that specific matter of having to overcome, you know, whether you call it the politics or wire ad or just implicit bias or just just mean spirited people who want to get in uh, to not want um, someone who they might not feel is deserving mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to move forward. I think the most important part for any untenured faculty member is to get a mentor, to get someone who's been through what you what you're going through, and to trust their 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 uh their knowledge and their advice. Uh, <clears throat> it's it's it was almost like, you know, getting tenure is like hazing almost. <laughs> it's like joining a fraternity. And, and, and I don't suppose you join any fraternities. I, you know what? Really, I was I was a lamp, which means that's the guy. That's that's, the, that's you're gonna be a Q. You're gonna be a lamp before you can be a Q. <laughs> and I didn't make it. I, I, that's another long story. Sure. But um, <laughs> yeah, that's really that's really a funny story. But uh, but I think what's most important is that you get someone that you can trust and that can be your mentor. I had one guy that was not actually a faculty member. He was an HR man. The late Theodore Johnson called him Big Ted. Big Ted was used to be a football player for. University of Wisconsin. And uh, his last position uh, in life was vice president of, uh, of human resources at a university in Newark. It was an engineering school. And he told me something when I was grieving. He said, Floyd, you got to outthink people. Get all that anger out of you. Don't want to fight anyone, you know, focus on winning your, your grievance. But also as you, as you attempt to win, you have to think like you're successful or that you're going to be successful and understand who you, who, who you're fighting against. And I think because of who I am, I know more about the people who I'm fighting than they know about me. And, and maybe because I'm an African American, I don't know, but because uh, I was in primarily a, a white institution at that time, and it's just about primarily white now. But but uh, uh, Ted told me to outthink people and not 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 dwell on your anger, dwell on 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 the future, how you're going to succeed, and that was the that was the that was the a conversation with him in my office was the one factor that changed my whole life there. Mm. And I, I was, I was in 80, 87, I was a finalist at Berkeley and I didn't get the job, but um, I didn't apply anymore after that because I said, Oh, wow. I was a finalist at Berkeley. <laughs> And these folks didn't want me, didn't want me here at UH downtown. That, mm. I, I said, well, you know what? I like UH downtown as a professor. I love Houston. And I could do anything I want to do in Houston that I could do in New York City or California. So my advice to, to new faculty, to new staff, is to always seek someone that you can you, you can get knowledge from that's stable, that's like-minded have similar values and understands the system. 
And you, you know, everyone has to go through that system. Some folks can get through it easier because of who they are. But regardless of that, you can manipulate, you can go through the system. You got to do your work first. You got to do, <coughs> you got to be a good teacher. You got to do your scholarship. You got to do your service. But you got to understand how to pace yourself to do all those three elements. And so uh, my advice to anyone is to, to get someone that they can, they can, they can call, you know, and, and, and have lunch with. Hmm. There were a couple of people who have already retired. They adopted me, you know. Uh, I'm still there, but but uh, we would talk about, you know, manipulating through the system. There are some that are there now that I mentor, you know. And so, mentoring is very important for any for any for any field. Hmm. For any field, you my my son, who's an engineer, who's now working for himself in the financial uh, part. Now, not in, he's not engineering now. My, my uncle, when, on his first job, he had some problems. And my uncle called him. And my son listened to my uncle. And he gave him some good advice. Uh, and my son took that and grew from it. You, know? you got to be able to accept things that you don't want to do because that's the only way you're gonna get through it. Everybody has to do something that they don't wanna do. So, you know, life is not about everything going your way and the way you want it to go. It's about how can you fit in, 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 in that, that uh, environment and be a contributor and feel like you're necess- you need it. You see, so I made myself necessary, needed. And then most importantly, I, I did things off campus in my career. That's where my salvation came. Yeah. Doing things beyond the city, the state. And that's what I tell people. You got you can't just be known in, in the city or the state. You gotta be known nationally or in mm-hmm. gotta really get involved with your with your career. And either they, and even if they deny you. When you go through a grievance, you'll you'll succeed. Yeah. So you 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 get tenure and you're in your thirties by now, so early in your career, you know, relatively early right. uh, in your in your career. But you you stay the course and you decide after that, you know, opportunity of you, you know, Berkeley where you can take the job, you home back in. How do you continue to grow? An academician uh, post even in tenure. Well, well, you know that, that quote that I made <clears throat> at eighty. Yet I still learn. You, you should always be trying to seek knowledge. So as a as a professor, you cannot stay stagnant. You have to learn new things. You've actually got to also correct things because. In most of our subjects that we teach, you would think that everyone that you are talking about, everyone who has contributed to that professor, put that profession, was white. And what I learned through my education was that every culture in the world has contributed to the success of everything. I mean, architecture and science, that's an African thing. That's, that's Persia. They, they were more developed than, than, than in Europe. The Greeks came down that, to, to the uh, northeast part of Africa to learn from those Egyptians and others. Uh, so when I teach my, my classes, I, especially my intro to visual arts, I make sure my Hispanic students know about great Hispanic artists, you know, and 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 others, uh, you know, I, I talk about how paper was developed. The Chinese were the first perfectors of paper, you see, 
and, and paper that was similar to what we're using now. And if it wasn't for that silk trade called Silk Trail, whatever it's called, where the Muslims would go down into, into China and get paper and they would exchange different things and they would bring it up through that Silk Trail. It goes through Afghanistan and, and then it started to go to Europe. You see, so when you know the whole story about man, then no one is left out. Everyone is equally important. But when we are taught or when we teach, <clears throat> our minority students sometimes feel like they didn't, they weren't a part of, or that people weren't a part of, of what they're learning. Sure. And that's, that's a travesty. That's, that's a failure of the educational system. Everyone who is a teacher should share the whole truth, not part of it. And they should make every everyone in that in, in that's that's their student feel like they're people. excuse me. Let me get this dog out of here right quick. Hold on, there, no problem. Sorry about sorry about that, but uh, no problem. But uh, I think to be a teacher, you've got to do some other research, especially when you're in a school that's that's diverse as UH downtown. Sure. And 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 a lot of people don't realize that students. It's it's a subconscious. It's when you're a minority, just like I was telling you when I went to my first integrated school, I thought that I may have been inferior or I wasn't capable of doing what they what they were doing. I think most students, maybe not most, quite a few of them though, when they don't see that they are a part, their people are a part of, of that particular subject and all they see are white professors um, they, in their subconscious, they, they feel, well, I'm trying to be like that person, but I don't know many people like myself, that's that kind of person, engineer or whatever. And so I think it's a failure in the educational, uh, system, college, middle school, high school to teach true history in any subject, not just art, engineering, mathematics, whatever. I mean, we just found out what two years ago, those black women, hidden figures, yeah. wasn't for them. Uh, uh, what was John Glenn wouldn't have, wouldn't have come back. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm saying. So there are there are a million stories like that yeah. in all fields, yet those things aren't taught. And so it's not about you adding. It's, it's that you may you may subtract one person and put this person in there, or you add, or you add. It doesn't it doesn't it doesn't dilute the, the, the curriculum. It doesn't harm it. It enhances it, and it makes sure that your students that you're teaching, if you really care about them, they should have examples in front of them. I want to come back to that point that you've just made about teaching the full history because, like you hit it right on the head the mission of the podcast of my brother podcast is harnessing those stories and sharing it and helping people be able to see themselves reflected in these stories mm -hmm. so that but i want to come back to that uh, about stories of other artists but before that i want to talk about how you made these different decisions that i think were critical along your career path because i think a lot of artists have to decipher what route to go. You're more of what I might consider a classically trained artist, but by staying on that academic track, you allow yourself enough flexibility to continue to pursue your art. So talk to us more about the, you know, the continuation of you uh, of your pursuits as just being an artist in a real sense and sort of what journey that continues to take you on. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> first thing uh, for me, 
Being that I was in academia um, and still I still am, I had to have some kind of uh, game plan for being in the art world. Okay. Well, what I finally realized is that most of the great artists were teachers. I mean, Bearden taught math. Um, uh, uh, Jacob Lawrence taught at the University of, of Washington in Seattle. Uh, Lifterstein taught. I can go on and on about these artists that were teachers. Later in their life, in their career, that they become full-time artists. John Biggers, a professor of art. John, the late John Scott, a professor of art. So when I think about, about the things that I have, I have to do, or I had to make sure that I got out enough to meet people in order to get my career going. And so that was, a, that was one show in 1986 that propelled my career. Uh, Alvia Warlaw, who was the director of the Museum of Texas Southern's Museum of Art. She <clears throat> put together a show at the Studio Museum in Harlem called Emerging Artists from the Southwest. And I was fortunate enough to be one of the artists that, that she selected. It was my first show in New York City at the renowned Studio Museum of Harlem. That is the premier, that is the signature museum of visual arts of African-Americans in the world. And right now they are building a new building, okay? But in 86, so I was, I was in that show, it was a group show. They had two prizes. One, they would purchase one of the works. The other, an artist could come up there for the summer and be a resident. I won the latter. I became an artist in resident for three months. And really that was the best thing for me because my studio mate was Kerry James Marshall. Now I'm not sure if you ever heard of Kerry James Marshall. Uh, he's a realist. Now he's not a realist. Now he's an abstract artist now <laughs> as of about five years. Uh, but Kerry James Marshall uh, and I became close friends. We go to lunch together, dinner. Um, the director of the museum was Howard Dina Con Conwell. She's now the, the deputy director of the Smithsonian African American uh, Museum of, of History and Culture, Culture and History, History and Culture, History and Culture. And so, 86 or important, well, 86, I had my first show in 86. I met a lot of people and I befriended them. And, and for an artist to succeed, he or she has to get beyond those, if he's a teacher or she's a teacher, you gotta get, gotta get beyond those, those walls of academia. You gotta go out and show your work to people, you know, or, or invite people to your studio. You gotta network. So when the museum was in, in DC was being thought about, they were doing fundraising, uh, they were getting ready to start, let's see, they, another couple of years, I think they were going to start, uh, start construction. And I heard that Howard Dean, I mean, Ken Shasha, not Howard Dean, Ken Shasha uh, was a uh, deputy director. So I called a friend of mine and said, hey man, could you call her and let her know I, I want to I show her my work? He said, man, you know where you call her. So I did. And she was so bubbly. She was like, we had been talking yesterday, you know, and now it was 86 when I was at the Studio Museum. And this is like 2000, okay? Wow. And I hadn't talked to her. And so I said, well, next time you're in Houston, please come to my studio. She said, Floyd, I'm always in your, to, to, to Houston, but I will make sure that I call you to make a visit. She came and made a visit. And she liked a particular painting. She said, well, Floyd, I like this painting, but I'm not the final say. The chief curator has to come and endorse this. And I said, that's the way I want it to happen. Because she told me 
But the other guy, other woman did not know me. So she had to work and only judge the work and not me as a, as a person. And she came and fell in love with that painting, bought the painting. And then one of my friends, she came down, uh, Kinshasa came down again and for a fundraiser. And I invited one of my collectors and he introduced himself to Kinshasa and said, I want to donate a painting of Floyd's. And so she said, oh, we'll be delighted to, to get a donation. So the painting that you see at the museum now, Smithsonian, that's the painting that was donated. The painting they bought is still in storage. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what I'm saying is, got to have determination, first of all. You can't give up. And in order to in order to do this, you got to work hard and you got to you got to get out. Can't just stay in the studio. You got to get out. You got to network. You got to go to shows. Let people know who you are. And you don't burn bridges. You definitely don't burn bridges. So during that time, I really had to start thinking about my style. What's going to be my signature style? You know, what's going to uh, make my work be Floyd Newsom? So I thought about my dad. My dad's a firefighter, so I, I would use a ladder sometimes as, a, as 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 one of my symbols. I would use my my great grandmother, who had just come out of slavery, her image. I would use fish and dogs and, and birds. And <clears throat> I had this <clears throat> group of things that I would use to symbolize, you know, what I'm about. The, the dog in, 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 in Egyptian mythology means the dog is loyal to the woman. In Western civilizations, it's just loyal. But in Egyptian mythology, the dog was a protector of the, of the, of the woman. Uh, the fish for me was the bird of the sea. The fish was my freedom symbol. You know, it's the fish goes through the water. You know, it's like a bird in the air. So I had these different images that were symbolic. So as opposed to just playing something really real, I would do sort of a an abstraction of it. And so that actually still connected me with my social issues. Although if you saw the work or if you, when you see the work, if you don't understand the iconography, you just think it's all about color and, and a few whimsical, whimsical forms. But when I start telling you, to, you know, what those forms mean, then you start to extract the, the personal side of, of, and the message that I'm trying to convey. The house. I put houses because I'm a, it's all about family. I was from a strong family. And, and, I, and my children were reared in a strong family. My wife, oh boy. Don't mess with my wife. <laughs> children, let's say it that way. Uh, she will be on you, you know. And so uh, uh, that's what kind of changed my, my, my direction after 10 or 12 years out of graduate school, <clears throat> after being at the Studio Museum in Harlem, being exposed to those New York artists, going to those galleries, I said to myself, I got to come back to Houston. I got to really establish who I am and what, what I can be. And, and that's really th that aspect that, that, that propelled me uh, in the art world, I think. Yeah. So you described this visit from Kinshasa in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. uh, which led to your work now being on display at the world famous National Museum of African American History and Culture. Right. Uh, she had to have the lead curator come take a look. What was that feeling you felt in that moment when the lead curator looked and said, I like it? And oh man, let me tell you. It was first, it was like fear. Because I'm saying to myself, she has to make the decision. I know Kinshasa loves the word, but when 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 Jacqueline came in, Sawyer came in, well, I didn't know her and she didn't know my work, but she was she became all bubbly. I said, Oh Lord, thank you. Lady likes the word. And I said, now, wow, 
when are they ever going to show it? <laughs> okay, that's that's my thinking because I'm I'm saying I know all the guys that are in the museum. Okay, I mean these guys are world renowned. My my reputation wasn't as big at that point. Okay, I mean you, you're talking about uh, 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 Jacob Lawrence and 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 Romare Bearden and and William T. Williams and 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 Kerry. No, well, Kerry's not in. I think Kerry's in the in Kerry James Marshall. I don't think he's in the in the uh, in the collection. Or he might be, but I haven't seen his work on exhibit. Alma Thomas and on and on and on. I'm saying, well, they, I'm in the collection, but when are they going to show it? So I go to the museum. The first place I go to is the fourth floor where the, where the gallery is. And to my surprise, the third painting is my painting. Wow. I said, you, can't, you can't miss my painting going in. If you do, you can't miss it coming back out. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was mind-boggling. I mean, that was like, God, not only did they accept my work, but they put it in a, in, a, in a perfect spot. You know, I mean, because usually when you get to seeing so much work, your eyes start getting tired. Yeah. You know, and you, you know, so my work caught people fresh. You know, and and, it's, and then when they're coming out, they can't help but see because it's so large. You know. Yeah. And so yeah. that was quite an honor. I said now. <clears throat> I've been in Street Museum in Harlem. Now I'm in a Smithsonian African American Museum of History and Culture. I mean, uh, on the mall, you know, the world's gonna see it. And and I've gotten all kinds of, of uh, you know, uh, notes from people. My students, my students will go to DC. Uh, all of my students, white, Hispanic, black, they make a point to go to that museum and they do a selfie, and they send it to me. You know how fun that is, how, how gratifying that is, how yeah. uh, being an institution, and that, that, that museum is the other critical part about my career, because it's just funny. You never need to give up. The day, the day you give up is the day you miss the blessing. And so I serve on the system-wide Art Acquisitions Committee. And I'm in the collection, you know, my works are in the in the uh, public service building, the old, the old commerce building on commerce and, and Main Street, four paintings. Yeah. And, and, you, so, and you're talking about for the University of Houston downtown. Right, for the University of Houston downtown. downtown. Right. Exactly. And so this is the 50th year of public la last year was the 50th year of public art that they've been collecting. So they did a big book on it. I'm in the book on several pages, but but to put the book together, to put the collection together, they had to hire uh, an appraisal company, and they had to, it took about two or three years to go through the whole collection, all four campuses, the main campus downtown Clear Lake, and the campus down in, in Victoria, and they had to assess all the works, so. That that company went to DC to see my work up. And so I'm being on the board, I'm on that on that committee. They were talking about, you know, putting the book together and about all the things they went through to assess the, the, the pain. They so said that. So when they got to me, they said, Well, Floyd, uh, you'll see in this document what your work, what your work, your work is worth now. They didn't tell me during that time. So when I got the commission, I this, this was back in 2005 to do those four paintings. I was paid $80,000 for those four paintings. That means $20,000 each painting. <laughs> Doing that, uh, after that meeting, I read the report and I saw the value of those paintings. Those paintings now are worth $820,000. <laughs> I mean, each painting is worth $205,000. Wow. So it went from 80,000 to 820,000. And that's all about not giving up. That's all about uh, due diligence, you know, you know, getting out there and putting your name out, working hard, uh, <clears throat> never looking at negatives as being the ending result, but 
like you said, everybody's gonna have failure. Fact. Anybody that's successful has had failure. How do you deal with failure? You see. And so I've learned <laughs> that that most artists have had rejections. Yeah. And and failures. It's the artist that succeeds is the one who continues to work and continue to be faithful to, you know, what they create. And that's what I am. I'm about being faithful to my craft. Yeah. And, and it has yielded uh, success for me. And, so, and, and I haven't gone as far as I'm going to go. Here, here. You know, Professor Newsom, I, I often lament the fact that I used to just walk by O'Kane Gallery when I was an undergraduate student at University of Houston downtown because I was getting my degree in biotechnology and us scientists, we just had no time for you artists. Uh, yeah, but. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let me tell you something, let me tell you something. You should have you should taken the class anyway because let me tell you what, my students who are in the sciences like you and in, 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 in the engineering areas, all those kind of areas, they said they take my class for therapy because uh, it's relaxing. Yes, yeah. yes. In, in hindsight, I think about that, especially as I sort of evolve into sort of a more creative side of who I was. I can tell you, Professor Newsom, when I was a student, I mean, my electives were like, you know, stuff that I was interested in and art just, I, I just didn't even think of it as, right. oh, I this, it could be relaxing because to me it was like, oh, I like political science. That's interesting and fascinating. And so yeah. that was sort of where I had my reprieve or taking history class, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and some of the other courses. And so, yes, that's uh, one regret was that I just didn't stick my head in and an okay <laughs> guy and get to explore the yeah. art you know, the bit yeah. more and are, uh, during that phase. But, you, you know, your career, in a sense, comes full circle with this sort of crown and achievement with being in the Smithsonian, you know, you made certain decisions earlier and we've explored that during this interview. For a lot of people, we have this perception that the genius artists are sort of the John Michel Basquiat who early on just have this unique style and they go on and do this fabulous thing. But You've just made an important point here that a lot of the very successful artists, they're not only trained in the discipline, they spend a lot of time honing that in. Can you sort of um, draw a parallel to what a Floyd Newsom's career might have been like had it not been for being on the academic track simultaneously? Well, if, if, uh, if I hadn't taught I probably would be in New York. Cause like I said, you know, I had an opportunity to make a decision to go to New York and, and manage, manage that building that my aunt willed to my dad, but I was scared. <laughs> so I look at it, I say, if I hadn't come to Texas, I don't know where my career would be, but I still would have been very happy because, uh, <clears throat> I'll work any kind of job to make it. And most artists, you know, they don't, Basquiatti was, was fortunate because he was a good friend of, 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 of Andy Warhol, okay? And so a lot of the artists who were young and successful, it takes one person or one gallery, even now, even today, to propel your career. And Basquiat just happened to be a graffiti artist who was put in jail a couple of times and, and um, got notoriety because he made the newspapers and befriended Warhol, um, Keith Herring, and, and, and quite a few others. But uh, most of us, they work for museums, you know, doing installations, hanging the sheetrock and putting up paintings and, and, and doing all kinds of things like that. Uh, I would have, uh, if I had not gone into academia, I probably would have been doing that, that similar thing. One of my buddies who's a New York artist, uh, uh, two of them, one worked in theater and doing props. Uh, another was 
He was doing, uh, got what he was doing. But now, neither one of them are working. They're just making their art. And and one, uh, Little, who is one year younger than me and graduated from Hamilton High School, same school I went to. We're both Memphians. Uh, he has this huge connect, huge uh, commission from 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 the uh, New York Transit Transit uh, Metro Transit Center, and I think it was like a half million dollar uh, contract or more, and he had to fabricate his his works in Germany, and so that's probably would have been my 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 way a course of 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 uh, of uh, success. I would have decided to stay in New York or Philadelphia and still would have made it. Still, who knows, I would have been bigger than I am now or, or not. But I tell you one thing, I never would have quit. I don't have quit in me. I, I, you, only, you, you, you only give me few when you tell me no. Yeah. So uh, I'm so glad you shared that. But if you were to from a public service announcement perspective, who are some of the other influential African-American artists of the 20th century uh, and perhaps even the 21st century that you think it's important that we know about? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm one of them for sure. <laughs> but, 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 uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, uh, my, my friend James Little, who's, who's in New York, uh, a lot of people don't, may not know of him. And, uh, and he was a realist who, who does nothing but abstraction. Uh, uh, if, you, if you think about locally, uh, uh, there's a guy by the name of Carter. Uh, can't think of his, he, he lives in St. Louis now, but uh, he's gonna be a hell of a name. Then there's Robert Pruitt and Robert Hodge. Uh, those are two African-American artists that are gonna be I think well, well known. Uh, as a group that you know, Houston has a a large number of African American artists, and uh, from from my age on down, and they're doing a lot of a lot of great work. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, now none of none of them are influences. They, these are people I just respect. Okay. Uh, I think you asked about my influence. Is that correct? Uh, sure. Uh, from the, I'd say the 20th century. Yeah. So you're talking about you're talking about Bearden, because Bearden had these collages that I just always just was amazed by. And I like William T. Uh, I'm sorry, not William T. Uh, uh, Johnson, uh, William H. Johnson, out of out of Florence, South Carolina. He was like uh, Van Gogh. Man, he was a prolific uh, painter. Matter of fact, uh, some of his paintings would, would crack you up because he was he was he was painting during World War II, and during World War II, there weren't there weren't that many silk stockings because they used the silk for the parachutes. And when they would make the silk stockings, they would always make them in the pink. So can you imagine an African American woman putting on pink? Stockings, it, it, it just the color wasn't working. But you see some of his paintings with these black ladies with pink stockings on, and his color, oh my God, it still astounds me. Uh, there's another artist, uh, Delaney. Uh, there were two of them, and uh, they they were they were just fantastic artists. But John Scott out of New Orleans, late John Scott. To me, he was like a, a Renaissance man because he could do sculpture, printmaking, painting, drawing. He just did it all. And so I really uh, 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 respect and, 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 and love that guy. In fact, John Scott was the reason why I made, I, I made those sculptures downtown in 2003. Uh, I got a commission to do these works. I was competing against two internationally known artists. Uh, and I won the contract. And it was funny because I had never done sculpture. I could make a model, but beyond that, I was lost. <laughs> so, 
And so I called John. I said, John, he had just, he had just had a commission on, on our campus. He had finished it. We'd be friends. And I said, man, I need you to help me with this contract, with, with how to make a sculpture. And he said, man, I'm going to be with you until you finish it. And he did. Long distance. And I, I, uh, I hooked up with the late Luis Humanis sculptor. And uh, he taught me about paint to use for the sculpture. Two artists, two sculptors, uh, one Hispanic, one African-American. They were the reason why I was so successful with that sculpture downtown. And now I've done, what, six of them. But uh, uh, so people that I respect, Humanis was one, Luis Humanis was one. Uh, and, and sad part about him and John Scott, they actually died because of the, the work that they do. Uh, Humanis was working on this piece. He'd been working for about two or three years. <coughs> Excuse me. And some kind of way it got loose and he didn't know it and it swung and hit him. He died from that. <coughs> John Scott, being a welder, would never wear a mask. So the fumes destroyed his lungs. So during Katrina, he, he came to Houston. And me and my wife and his wife and son, we would talk, you know, and I would always go up there to, uh, to see about him. And he passed away, you know, here. Uh, but those two guys helped me with my career as far as the sculptural part of it. What advice would you offer to a 20 or 30 year old version of yourself? Uh, most important thing is, is to work hard, be convicted to your craft, uh, refuse to think you know everything, to always feel you can learn something. Uh, so I, I would advise someone, but like, you know, uh, if I would, if I'm not sure if I would do things different, other than, other than working even harder, and and not fearing success. My wife told me many years ago. She said, "Floyd, you you fear success because you don't want to fail, and you got." So I have you have. If I were advising a young me, don't fear success. Don't fear failure. You know, uh, work hard day and night. You know, and and I remember one 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 time, uh, uh, my studio was at U of H, and I was doing this show, and I was it was crunch time. I stayed at this I stayed at that school for seventy two hours. I didn't go home to finish this painting. I had students working with me, and then they had done the part that they needed to do, and I needed to just buckle down on finishing up stuff. I told my wife I wasn't coming home for a few days, and I did. I told all the all the policemen that I was that I was there that I would tidy up in the in the restroom because at that time we didn't have a gym, <laughs> didn't have a gym, didn't have a shower, and so I had freshened up around six o'clock in the morning before people would start coming in, you know, in in the restroom, and and so it's it's me to advise someone 20, 30 years younger, you know, than me or whatever. Is is never accept uh, uh, def if defeat. If you if you if you if you lose ground, don't let it deter you. Don't let it frustrate you. That is actually the history of artists. That is actually the history of artists. So if you you're not tough enough to to uh, take some nose, then you're in the wrong field. You're in the wrong field. Yeah. Um, you're still involved in activism. Tell me why that's still important to you. Oh, because that's me. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm making sure that you know, my wife and I are going to work with a group trying to get people. Well, I'm a registered voter. I'm a registered. Uh, I can register people to vote. So but not only that, my wife and I both are, are able to, to register people to vote. But we want to make sure that people get to the to the polling uh, uh, stations if they're going to vote in person. So we're working with people to, to make sure we we vote. And uh, I marched, you know, during uh, the not the death of Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery. 
Yeah, I'll burn it. Yeah, I, I you, weren't you there for that? I was, I was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, you know, um, I still have to do those kind of things because if we don't do it, it's as 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 Joe Madison on 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 Sirius XM one twenty six would say. What are you going to do about it? Quit talking about the problem. What are you going to do about it? That's why you're doing this podcast because you you decide you're going to do something about it, about you know saving young black uh, 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 people and others who 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 don't have a sense of of worth, who don't have a sense that they can succeed. So you put role models up. That's that's a, you're an activist. My my way is to. Uh, to, uh, to participate in certain things, but also to to mentor, to teach people that they can that they can succeed. You know, um, I think it's important that we all have to be encouragers. You know, um, uh, in my in, in in my neighborhood, people, young kids still come to me sometimes. And say, Snoop, I remember when we were doing this and that, and and. And you didn't, you didn't attack us, you know. You kind of just calmly told us, you know, we, you couldn't, you should not supposed to be doing that. Selling drugs, okay, <laughs> you know. And and, and uh, it's how you, it's how you deal with people. You can change their ways, you see. And so an activist is not always the guy who's on the camera. He or she is the person who's in the community, just doing a one-on-one with people, saving, saving people from. From going to prison, there was one. I, one of my neighbors who went to prison, and he came back, and I mentored him. And he said, "You know, man, it's, it's guys like you that that I'm straight now. You see, and so uh, it's not like I said, I'm an artist, social servant, but they work together as one. So I'm not selfish. You know, I can do it all, and do it all with perfection." This has been an incredible uh, interview, learning about your story and journey. As you've shared, you've still got a lot left in you. So I want you to just kind of wrap us up with what's on the horizon for you and any closing remarks you want to share. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm doing a, a large body of work since, I, since you know, this pandemic. Uh, I'm totally involved with making all these new paintings <clears throat> and I'm trying to get, trying to get over overseas into Hong Kong. I have a son that lives there. And so I'm working on some things, uh, trying to get there. I was in a group show in Hong Kong mm, four years ago. And so I'm working on, on my, on my international, uh, uh, uh status. And, uh, Trying to trying to you know just continue to to uh, focus on on how I can uh, contribute to our society. So I, I my goal my goal is that there is no there is no no boundaries for me, and so I strive to to be as big as, as the Lord will allow me to be. And there are no limits. And so I'm working on this international uh, 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 connection. I've, I've been friends with quite a few people that may be helping me. Oh, and also there's a book coming out on me. It's gonna be published, I think by, you know, by a and it's, it's gonna take two or three years for this, this all to happen. With the pandemic, things have slowed down. But I got some people who are going to be writing essays, like Jackie Sawyer from the Smithsonian, Melanie uh, Harvey from Howard, uh, uh, Toby Caps, Camps, who used to be at the at the CAM, now is 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 in London, and uh, quite a few people who are going to be writing either in, you know introductory uh, 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 or comments at the end of the book, and then there's those who will be writing essays. So. The book thing is going to be really fantastic. And hopefully with that book, we have a traveling show. So I'm energized. You know, 
I walk the dog every morning and I do 70 push ups. Now they're real fast. <laughs> to do it correctly, I probably would do 30. <laughs> but I stay, I stay active, riding my bike, you know, keeping my keeping eating the right food. You know, my wife continues to help me with that, watching my diet, keeping my weight down. So uh, in closing, I, I just think that uh, you should always have a dream. Now, in order to have a dream, you, you got to wake up from it and work. You see, you just can't, it just doesn't come. The work, the work ethics is the most important thing for anyone in any career, in any, anything you want to do. And you got to accept some defeats, but you learn from the defeats. You learn from the, from the negative parts and you never allow yourself to get so angry that you can't focus on the positive because you can be a, you can be consumed by a negative. You can be consumed by uh, racism and never move forward. You got to understand that you are important that you got a mission and that you can succeed. And uh, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a verse in, in Deuteronomy says, uh, Lord says, uh, you may think you got the wealth uh, through these hands, but I gave you the ability to make wealth. So I always keep God with me. God is always my force, my refuge. And then in Psalms uh, 90, verse 17, it talks about the Lord blessing my, the work of my hands. So I'm, I'm a believer, and that's what sustains me. It can get me through any low periods, and it keeps me going. This has been wonderful, man. Uh, I, I've got to put in my single plug when the book comes out, and y'all are having some fanciful launch in New York. At least re remember to add me to the invitation list. That's oh, don't worry. Don't worry. worry. Don't worry. I got your email. I got your phone number. No, you go. In fact, I got the, the appraiser who, who appraised my work with all that money. She helped me with, 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 uh, with, with, with some things. So, no, when, when, it, when it comes out, you'll be part of it. You'll be part of it. Excellent. And I'm looking forward to it. You've yeah. talked about the importance of being convicted. And, and having full conviction in what you're doing and pursuing it with vigor. You've talked about the importance of not only not giving up, but continuing to learn and to be a lifelong learner. And then you've also talked about as an artist, the importance of finding your unique style, what makes you you. My guest today has been Floyd Newsom. My name is Lalu Davis Yemiton, and you've been listening to my brother podcast. Going through thick and thin, brother, you call.